Thank you all to you for coming out tonight. It's lovely and warm in here and I hope you'll enjoy our conversation. Um, it's, it's with Jane Sullivan. Now, I'm sure a lot of you turn to the Age column every Saturday morning, turning pages, to see what Jane is writing about, about books, about ideas, about writing. Uh, I know I certainly do, so it's lovely to have this conversation because Jane is not only a journalist and an accomplished journalist, but she's also a novelist and a most accomplished novelist. She's also won uh, the inaugural Australian Human Rights Award for Journalism. Uh, her first novel was The White Star, and this new novel, Little People, it's just gorgeous. It is just gorgeous. No wonder it's been shortlisted in the Cal Scribe Fiction Prize. So Jane is uh, an English woman who, who came here in 1979, only a blink of an eye, and she's put her time to very, very good use writing beautiful columns and also writing uh, this magnificent novel. It is a joyous novel that grabs you from the very first couple of pages. It's called Little People and it is the most extraordinary novel about well, dwarfs, I guess. Uh, and it is based on true stories, but her imagination has us soaring into the gothic heights uh, of some of the most extraordinary drama and excitement. It's beautifully written. And Jane, uh, it is absolutely a pleasure to have read it. And I wish I could write as you write. Oh, thank you, Mary. That's a lovely thing to say. And thank you all for coming out this evening, this wintry Melbourne evening. I'm really, really happy to be here with Mary. Um, I, I was thinking how I'm going to introduce her, and you all know who she is, really. Um, I mean, this is the woman who, who has to be the second most famous red-headed politician in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I'll, I'll introduce her nevertheless. Um, I'm sure most of you uh, came to know Mary as I did, as a familiar television face, one we could rely upon for incisive news reporting, and often from some pretty dangerous places in the world, and for her authoritative news reading and engaging interviews. Um, I remember her on the 7.30 report, Four Corners, Asia correspondent for the ABC, commercial television, and hosting the ABC arts program Sunday afternoon. And when Mary was on, you always knew you were going to get good, intelligent, and sometimes quite groundbreaking television. And she's won awards, including the Gold Walkley. Then she went over to the dark side and she entered politics. She was, I'm sure you remember, a senior Victorian government minister for seven years. And she was minister for education, planning, the arts, women's affairs, and the Commonwealth Games program. Uh, she's still active influence in our community as a government and media relations consultant. She sits on several boards and she's doing, I might say, great things for Victorian writers. She's going to head up Writing Australia, which is a new national organisation representing writers' states, um, centres in five states, including Victoria. And she's also made her farm, Rosebank, available as writers' retreat. However, I think that the most extraordinary thing that Mary has done lately is to write this very, very candid memoir, Private Life, Public Grief. It's about a life in journalism and politics, but it's nothing like any other politician's book you've ever read. It's more really about a life of coping with quite wrenching sorrow and depression. And as I'm sure some of you will know, um, Mary's private grief was due mainly to the fact that her husband, Jock Rankin, um, at a very young age, contracted cancer and died. And this book is really about how she came to terms with that. I was in tears when I was reading it, I don't mind saying. And yet at the same time, I don't think it's a depressing book, Mary. Um, I would recommend it to you all as an inspiring book. Is this still... Yeah, I thought we'd lost that for a moment. So... That's Mary, that's me, and um, perhaps I'll open the discussion. I, I hope we're not going to get to a situation where we're, we're such 
keen interviewers were just asking each other questions all the time for <laughs> answering them. But um, I thought, Mary, I'd start off just with a very general um, question about communication, because here we are. I've been a communicator as um, a print journalist and now as a novelist, and you've been a communicator as a television journalist and as a politician and now as a memoirist. And I thought we might reflect a bit on, on the, the different ways in, in which we've been communicating over the years, and perhaps you'd start with that? Yes. Uh, well, I think we, we use words that build bridges between ideas. And certainly my experience as a journalist, as a television journalist, which is how I was trained, it was very minimalist. Um, we were trained to write to complement the pictures. We had outstanding, I was very fortunate, I worked in current affairs and on Four Corners and overseas, so we had quite graphic and well thought out um, and beautifully constructed, uh, constructed pictures to work with. But the idea was that you always complemented the pictures. So it was minimalist. Um, with writing a memoir, I had to learn uh, to expand, to peel the onion, in fact. And I can remember one experience sitting with my editor and she was giving me a lot of very helpful advice and I think she was probably shaking her head and thinking, my God, will this ever work? Like this microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and she said, yeah, you know, chapter two is working nicely. That's looking good. Now, chapter three, those notes are terrific. <laughs> and I thought, notes? You know, I've written half a chapter here. This is award-winning stuff, but I... <laughs> <laughs> Notes. So I went back that night and, and, re and she was absolutely right. I was writing as though the reader was looking at the pictures that I was looking at in my head. And so uh, that was a very, very good lesson. Now, the third part of that tripod that you, <laughs> you referred to is communicating as a politician. Well, I'm here to tell you that was a failure. <laughs> that was a real failure. I mean, modern politics, sadly, is about message control. It is about minimalism, except that it's repeating the same lines over and over again. And I got very frustrated with you know, junior media advisers um, and some very experienced media advisers who expected ministers to trot out these lines day after day. Now, you do need to be consistent in what a government says about what's going on. Um, but I think we, we've swung too far the pendulum so that now in contemporary politics I think it is not about communication, it's about saying the least you can get away with so that you don't offend anybody, <laughs> rather than conversely uh, taking an idea and advocating for it and advocating hard for it. And, you know, if a few people disagree with you, well, it's a contest of ideas. So the three different styles of communication are actually quite different, but in the end, probably what works, and you know, it's interesting for a novelist, is what is the idea at the heart of what you are trying to say? What mm, is the idea? Yeah. yeah. Well, th I mean, that's interesting to compare with my own experience. So fortunately, I never had to do the politician a bit. I'm, I'm sure I'd have been absolutely dreadful at it, so just as well. But um, I started off as um, a journalist um, in my early 20s, um, and I went into it because, for two reasons really. One was that my father was a cartoonist, and, and we were living in England at the time, and he was a cartoonist on newspapers like The Guardian and The New Statesman. And I go to visit him at his offices. And in a sort of a scruffy way, they were actually very glamorous places and full of very glamorous pe people. That I, w I was uh, thinking, oh, it'd be fun to work here and have these sort of discussions and arguments about politics and the arts and so on, and then write it all down and send it out and see my name in lights on the, on the page. So I was attracted to that. And the other thing was that I always wanted to write. Ever since I was a kid, I would dream up stories and write them and so on. But I thought, well, how on earth am I going to get somebody to pay me to do this? And I thought, well, if I write as a journalist, then they'll, they'll, maybe they'll, I, they'll give me a job and they'll pay me to do it. And I was really thrilled when I did start to get jobs in journalism. And um, 
So that was my life for a long, long time. I, I always wanted to be a writer and to write uh, fiction, but it got a bit buried under this urge to be a journalist, which was pretty, as you know, it, it does sort of take over your life and become very time-consuming and, and um, fills all your thoughts. And, and if you let it, it'll just take over your life completely. And uh, for a long time, I was I was uh, doing this and loving it. But what you're concentrating on is is so different to what you concentrate on when you turn to fiction. I, don't you find that? It's, it's uh, well, not that you're writing fiction, but you're writing what we might call creative nonfiction, which has a lot of similarities. I, that, that's what I'd call it, creative nonfiction. There's no doubt about that. I mean, there's sections in the book where I write about cabinet. Now, I'd be thrown into jail if I actually wrote the facts of what was said in cabinet. <laughs> and and I was reminded of that by um, by a lawyer close to the government at the time I was writing. So I've, I've taken that very seriously. Um, but I think that is right, that as a journalist, you are, you are thinking from the outside mm -hmm. as a, a memoirist or a novelist. Uh, I suspect you're thinking from the inside. But what attracted us to journalism uh, in the first place is, I think, very similar to what, in my case certainly, and the way you've mm -hmm. described your experience, is very similar with you. And I thought I might just read a couple of lines, if I can, from, uh, from this book about, for me, what was the fascination of journalism. Mm, sure. I loved journalism. It gave me the key to Aladdin's cave, to the hidden treasures of human existence in all its forms, the good, the bad and the ugly. A magic carpet ride around the country and around the world, dipping into people's pleasure and pain, their power and powerlessness. I was a curious and remunerated student of the human condition, intrigued by the way people live, the way power is used and abused, and yes, the way people die. I asked a political thug in El Salvador why he ran death squads, a scientist why he wanted to create humans in a test tube, a deputy prime minister about love, Oh, that was a long time ago, and an, <laughs> and an Olympic swimmer about how fame had overwhelmed her. Like politics, I often didn't know what characters I might meet or issues I might need to be briefed on or clamber over on any single day. Eclectic and heartbreaking stories tumbled over each other, sometimes in a day, in a week. And of course, it's the pace of journalism Whereas when yeah. you start mm -hmm. writing in that extended discursive way, mm. you have to slow it all down. But the pace is absolutely the key to it because um, I, I can relate very much to what you're reading there, that adrenaline rush of getting out in the world and, and, and having this wonderful excuse to go and talk to just about anyone about anything that, that, that excites you and fascinates you. It, it's like, as you say, it is a, a key to Aladdin's cave. Um, and... But suddenly, he, when you're writing fiction or creative non-fiction or whatever, you, suddenly you're in an internal world. You're sitting in a little room by yourself. You're not out there talking to people and, and taking in great events and witnessing history. You're just in there with a room, in, in a room with what's going on in your brain and what's coming down on the paper or, or, the, or, the, or the, the screen of your word processor or whatever it is. And it, it's a very different world, and you have to slow down. And that, I find that one of the hardest things was to slow down because I'm so used to writing to a deadline. My first job, I used to come in, and um, at 8 o'clock in the morning, I would have to ring round a few people, like the, the fire people and the police, and I'd have to pick up what they said. And by 8.30, I would have to file a couple of stories. So I'd have half an hour to make phone calls and then file the stories. They're very simple stories, of course, very short, but nonetheless, you had to get them right. And to go from that to suddenly, here you are, sitting in a room, and you're going to work on something which is probably going to take weeks, months, years. If I'd known how long this, this book was going to take, I'm not sure I would have started. It took about six years altogether. And even before you start writing, there's the research. And that's another thing I thought we should talk about, because I love research. I adore it. And the danger is that you get so caught up in it, it's so seductive, that without the deadline, and you're, you're not going to stop. You're just going to be forever researching and not writing. Oh, absolutely. I, I relied on my diaries for, mm -hmm. for this. And, uh, you know, as a journalist, I've always kept 
diaries or journals. And going back through uh, this period, I was I was shocked at the amount of detail, and I was shocked at the uh, at the raw emotion that mm. came through. But it was a very very helpful, uh, you know, primary document, mm. if you like. Mm. But then I would go and check my facts. And I would do that. It would be this researching and researching and researching. And without that deadline, of course, there was no end to this. So it allowed me to put off the actual writing. You know, I was trained as a television journalist. Seven o'clock, the news went to air. You had to yeah. be there. Mm -hmm. 7.30, uh, the program went to air. And whether we were ready or not ready, we had to be there. You can't have an empty chair. So with writing, I could always have an excuse to do just yes. one more check. The endless procrastination disguised as research. <laughs> Until the editor gives you, you know, a drop dead deadline. Yeah. And then suddenly I was immensely efficient. Yes. <laughs> I don't think I was writing any better, but I was more efficient. I mean, do you think there's a way around that? Is there a way of giving yourself a deadline, or is it you just don't believe yourself? You're a very bad boss. I, I, I never really found the solution to that. Well, you know, I've, I've read lots of books about how to be a how to be a writer, and uh, the story is boiled down to one line, which is sit down and write. Yes. You know, you can have endless books, and I'm sure lots of people have made a lot of money uh, through these books. But uh, many of them said, try and write in the morning. Give yourself mm. that degree of discipline. So then you say, OK, I'll write 300 words a day or 50 words a day, whatever you like. And in two weeks, I should have so many words. Mm -hmm. And that's my deadline. That's my own personal deadline. But I instantly sabotaged that as well because I said, look, I'm trained as a television journalist. I don't think very well in the morning. <laughs> I function better late at night, and it's true. Yeah. You know, when I disappeared to, to the farm to, to really finish writing this, I'd do everything else in the morning, and mm. then by lunchtime I could sit down. I could write till 9 o'clock at night uh, if I had to. Mm. So, you know, we sabotage ourselves, but it doesn't stop you giving yourselves deadlines. It's fun to break them. Yeah. <laughs> and did you find, um, because it, it's such a huge change coming from journalism and politics into writing memoir, did you find that what you needed to do, you mentioned reading books about how to be a writer and so on. Did you also go to classes and, and study and, and so on? Oh, absolutely, mm -hmm. yes, I did. Um, uh, because I think if you stop learning, you're dead in, mm -hmm. in any... Mm -hmm. Any area, but if you are taking on a, a new professional task, um, again, I think you need to learn as quickly from those who know better than you. So yes, that's why you know the Victorian Writers Centre um, was an absolute. Boom. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah. I and that. also, so different classes that happen here are really important. Uh, but also, I went on a, a writer's walk um, down to Tasmania and that was the impetus really to do something serious about this book and it was over um, Christmas and no it was after Christmas over New Year. How can you walk and write at the same time? Oh well it's very easy really you do anything to avoid writing and then conversely you do anything <laughs> to avoid walking so so in the end you, you do a little bit but this was in the Tarkine um, mm -hmm. in northeast Tasmania the most beautiful wilderness area um, I think in Australia actually and we were there for a week. We had to carry our packs. We had to walk through rivers. The drought broke at the time that we were in the forest, so it rained heavily every day. But we had a writing tutor, and we would we would do exercise. We would mm. walk. We'd you know sit in the mud or sit in the rain, <laughs> and we'd write. Uh, we'd disappear to our tents and uh, and write. And so because of uh, well. The impetus of nature, which is always a big influence mm. on my, you know, limited creativity, but the fact that we were so constrained by nature and by the space, you simply had to write. Plus, this writing tutor was terrific on meditation. Oh, yes. And she'd do guided meditation. So, and you know, I remember the first time I was sitting down against a tree trunk, and she's going on about things, and I'm thinking, what am I doing here? <laughs> am I doing here in the middle of the forest listening to this garbage? And, you know, then before I knew it, she said, now pick up your pen and start writing. And, um, you know, what I wrote sitting there against that tree trunk is, is actually in this book. So uh, that taught me to, 
ignore my rational brain. That's another thing about journalism. Yes. You have to yes. be the cynic. Yeah, it, it's, it's a very different mindset, isn't it? I mean, the, the other thing are very noticeable, which is, is something, you know how the advice in creative writing classes is, is uh, show, don't tell. Well, journalism is all about telling. You've got to tell people what's going on. You've got to explain what, what these events all mean. You've got to find out first, usually by talking to people who do know what's going on, you hope, and then you have to communicate that to readers or, 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 or watchers or listeners or whatever the form is. And, and you have to get it absolutely clear and, and as brief as you can and um, as, as simple as you can in ways that it's often very, very complicated ideas you have to reduce to something simple, get right to the heart of, of what's going on. Uh, when you're writing um, fiction, anything more creative, memoir, whatever, you don't tell people what's going on. You want Want them to work it out for themselves. What you're doing is creating a kind of framework where they can read between the lines and they can see what's happening and they can understand what's happening. But they have the pleasure of finding them out themselves. The last thing you want to do is, is when you're reading that kind of work, is to be told what to think about something. You want to find it out. And so I found that one of the hardest things is, is getting out of that framework where you're telling people what's going on to just let them letting them soak it up and realise for themselves. Did you find that too? Well, I hadn't until this moment thought about that, you know. Oh. Because with journalism, um, particularly with television journalism at the time that I was working, there was always this sense of projecting certainty. Mm. There was an emphasis on uh, research, rigorous research, tested by your editor, um, and you wouldn't go to air unless you, you were certain about your story. And so there was this sense of authority and certainty mm -hmm. that, that you had to project. Um, and of course, with the sort of writing that we're talking about, it's almost the opposite, isn't it? It's, mm, yeah. I mean, you, you have a lucidity with writing that, that is, is, is very much more mature than mine. But again, you're asking the reader to come with you on this, mm. this tale. Mm. And there's nothing certain about where it's going to take the reader. Whereas with journalism, particularly, for example, if you're reporting um, from an international war zone or from four, four, four corners, you, you certainly have to have your research down and present this certainty. I can remember Frank Morehouse, a wonderful, wonderful writer, um, saying something about television journalism. We were working together um, for the union on reviving the code of ethics. Now, we wrote it. I don't know whether we revived it, but anyway, there's a group of us doing this. And he was sitting around the table at one stage. He said, the trouble with television journalism is that we've got this unearned cynicism. And it struck me that there's that's true, that has crept in, and maybe I was guilty of it myself. I'm not sure. I hope not. I hope I was never cynical, uh, questioning, but not cynical. Mm. If there's a hint of that in good writing, particularly in a novel or a memoir, I think, you know, you just simply put it down. You don't continue. I think the only place where cynicism is acceptable is satire. I think you, you need a bit of cynicism there, but, but otherwise I agree. I think that there needs to be a sort of qu almost a quality of innocence and wide-eyedness about, about other kinds of writing. And I've, certainly in journalism, I've always fought against that sense of creeping cynicism that I think is, is too easy to creep up on you. I can remember when I was young seeing older colleagues and, and they were so mm -hmm. they'd seen it all, they'd done it all, they, they thought they knew it all and, and it was all pretty bloody depressing that, that was their general attitude and you know, what can you expect as a politician And they were the journos who never left the office, you know, or they were yeah. reporting on the war in El Salvador, you know from the comfort of the, um, the hotel in mm. San Salvador mm. That's true. That yeah. I, think, true. I think you have to some, somehow as a journalist, and it becomes harder as you get older, you have to preserve both your sense of wonder and your sense of horror at, at one, at, and, and appreciate the wonderful things and, and get outraged at the appalling things all over again every time. So is, is it a sense of wonder uh, that drives us to write still? Um, I, yeah, I think that's part of it. Um, and certainly when I switched to fiction, I, um, what I experienced was an enormous sense of wonder that I was free to make things up. 
Yeah. It was, it was yeah. so exciting and so liberating. I mean, I was still, in, in the case of this book, I was still doing my research. I was still finding out about these, uh, these real little people who were dwarfs who came to Australia in 1870 and toured the country. And I was finding out everything I could find about them and um, looking them up and in all sorts of books and reading about them. But nonetheless, I thought, well, there's only so much that's known about them. Uh, we don't really know what their characters were like because they were performers and what you read about is the performance, not the reality. And that freed me up. That made me think, well, I can imagine what these people are like and no one's going to tell me I'm wrong. And, and so what if they do? It's fiction. I can do it. So it was enormously... Uh, Did you use the photographs? Because they're magnificent. And they're real photographs of General yes, Tom indeed, Farman yes. and the sisters. Mm. Did you use those photographs as a way of sparking your imagination? Yes, that was one thing I did, yes. I, um, when I first started researching this years ago, you couldn't just look up everything on the net the way you can now. But I got out a lot of books and um, I, uh, from the library, and I went at one stage, I travelled up to the, um, uh, the National Library in Canberra to get hold of a book I couldn't find anywhere else. And this was an account by the manager of the troupe of their tour. And that had um, illustrations of the time, engravings, so I, I looked at those and, and I remember opening this book very reverently and I was terrified because it began to fall to pieces in my hands. It was very old and, and for some reason the copy was very fragile and I, I felt like Mr Bean when he goes to the library and he's opening this, this priceless manuscript and it's falling apart and I was hoping the librarians weren't to come, come along and take <laughs> it away from me. <laughs> But yeah, it was it, the visual stimuli in researching this. I think were at least as important, if not more important, than what was written down. It was seeing the pictures. Were, you you could just look at a picture of Tom Thumb and, and think about him and think what was going on in that little brain. Uh, it was just fantastic to do that. I think that um, photographs are really handy and, and, and of course lots of writing classes will ask us to take a photograph and you know extrapolate um, from our imagination and just write a story. I'm wondering also about uh, time out and away from the madding crowd. I mean, journalism is right in the middle of the madding crowd, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and uh, whether you're talking about the newsroom or, you know, the editing suite or uh, out there interviewing someone and, and responding to a deadline, what we have to do then when we become writers is, is escape back to the, the inner. You spent a bit of time at Varuna, uh, the writer's house, and yes. you're going off now to Glenfern. Mm -hmm. So tell me how important that, that has been to your writing and, and why? Yeah, why do you need to? Retreats, I think, are very important. It, it, I mean, your, your walking tour in Tasmania, in, in a sense, is a kind of retreat. I think you need, yeah, you need to get away from the everyday. Um, and for me, that whole concept that Virginia Woolf had of a room of one's own is very important. And um, um, I do have a room of my own at home. I've got a study. But it's nonetheless, it, it's a place where I do, I write articles as well as well as fiction and of course it's a place where I get emails and the phone rings and the family comes in and wants various things done and then I've got to do the washing and the cooking and, and everything becomes part of the day and, and your day is constantly interrupted. So the idea of going off to a room where all you ought to do is either write or just sit and think about writing or read some little bit of research that's to do with your writing is just such a luxury for me and so fantastic because I think apart from anything else what you need is not just time to write but time to think. Mm. If you're going to produce anything of, of any sustained value you need to actually just be able to sit down and think not necessarily in a very constructive way but just have a little muse and a little dream and, and allow yourself time to do that and not think well in five minutes I've got to put the washing on or I've got to make that phone call or I've got to check my emails or whatever so Glenfern has been fantastic in that way I had um I was sharing a room there earlier this, this year and um, for next month I'm going to have six months sharing with another writer which is part of this great system that the Victorian Writers Centre runs where you apply for a fellowship and if you get one you can stay there for free for a time and it's, it's a wonderful environment to write in. And Varuna as well was, was um, enormously helpful. The added benefit of Varuna is that it's residential, you can stay up there for two weeks or three weeks or whatever. 
And um, sometimes you get help from um, people who are there, mentors. I, I, my, I had some mentoring help from um, a writer called Amanda Lurie, some of you may know of, and also from Peter Bishop, who was until recently the head of, of Varuna. And uh, he's one of those people who you can have delightful chats with him, and he goes, he's read your manuscript, you know that, and he talks along, and he's, you're waiting for the bit where he actually tells you what he thinks and what he thinks you should do to your manuscript, and he, he rambles on all over the place. You think, what is he talking about? And when is he going to get to the point? And after a while, you realize this is it. This is the point. What he's telling you is helpful to your writing. Um, but it takes a while to realize that it's because he works in this very elliptical way. Any of you who've worked with Peter Bishop will know what I mean. Um, so, yeah, I, I think these sort of places where you can just go away and either commune with other writers or commune with a mentor or just be by yourself and just focus on your writing and nothing else, I think that's enormously important to have that. It's about the elasticity of... of time isn't it it's mm -hmm. and and this open-ended conversation with the ideas that might float into your head and again that's a difference with journalism In journalism you you constantly applying the the rational mind to to question the research to question the press release to then analyze and and rewrite um, with this form of writing that we're discussing it's uh, it is actually going at it from a very non-rational perspective mm. often. Mm. Although that might sound contradictory when you've done the amount of research that you clearly did for little people. But um, in right, with Writing Australia, we want to connect up uh, a national network of residential writers' re retreats because there seems to be a huge demand for it, to be away from the matting crowd, to have this elasticity of time and space just to immerse yourself in, in you probably don't know what yeah. until yeah. you spend the time and let mm. that time take you away. And I think um, up at Rosebank Farm, one of the great joys that I have is um, when, peop when writers have been using the place to go and read what they write in the visitor's book and apart from the fact they might talk about the possums in the roof or, you know, the fact that, uh, uh, you know, the rain made the, the driveway pretty muddy, they will always talk about this sense of the first few days, you know, organising themselves and trying to settle down and get some writing done. And then they move into this phase of just let it happen. Just let the creative muse, however it's going to work, overtake you mm -hmm. and you know there's no television and uh, and you know it's hard to get your emails yeah. and it's not easy sometimes people get a bit spooched did you find that yep. the, 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 yeah the, they the, do the, well sometimes when, when there's no excuse you've got to write people start thinking oh my god and they get quite paralyzed with with fear of what what they're going to do and that mm. seems to be a necessary phase to go through sometimes well i guess that's part of writing isn't it and again it's about dealing with that demon on your shoulder that says, why would anyone be interested in this, <laughs> you know? I mean, my view about this book was, when, when I was asked would I write something after I left politics, I thought, no. I mean, most political memoirs, they shouldn't be written, actually. Um, <laughs> unless you're a prime minister or a, a premier, and, even and then, I think a few of those sure. shouldn't have taken up the pen, that's right. <laughs> or either, you know, you've been part of some really juicy sexual scandal, like the Profumo affair or, or something like that, and the Brax government, no, 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 that didn't happen. So you have to deal with that. And then most writers I know say at some stage that demon says, you know, this is rubbish. Who cares what you're writing? Why are you writing this? Well, it must have been particularly difficult for you in that way because um, journalists are trained to leave themselves out of the story. You, know, you never put yourself in. It's always about what other people are doing and it's considered ridiculously self-indulgent. Although, although things are changing a little, that was certainly the way I was trained. You know, you never use the word I if you can avoid it. But this this book is, is is all I, and it needs to be I, because you're talking about your own very deep, personal, intimate feelings in the context. Of, so sometimes you're writing about being a, a kind of automaton on the outside and going through the motions, where is inside you're in, you're in deep turmoil. And uh, I've, I wonder if that was perhaps one of the hardest aspects of writing this. Um. Uh, yes, it was hard, but I have to say that the writing was part of the revelation. You know, I learned a lot about myself and myself at that time in writing uh, the book. And what I learned um, was, you know, why didn't I ask for help? It was offered. 
Yeah. It was, you yeah. know, given to me in spades if I would take it. And you didn't actually tell anyone that you were suffering from depression, for example, did you? No, that I was didn't. And that was quiet. a revelation. That was mm. through a couple of writing friends read uh, a few chapters and asked that question. So who did you tell? I said, well, nobody. Mm. And that was, that was quite shattering for me um, because I thought, what an absurd proposition. Well, firstly, I denied it, you know. I thought people uh, who've had my blessings and opportunities and experiences, so I've hit a hurdle, it was a big one, uh, but, you know, you get mm. over it. Um, and that depression strikes people who've had a series of pretty tough things happen to them. Uh, so firstly, I denied it. I was ignorant of it. Um, but then I think I thought at that time, if I admitted to myself any weakness or frailty, let alone admitted to anybody else, the whole pack of cards would come tumbling mm -hmm. down. But it was a mistake and uh, it was a, an error of judgment and uh, I didn't uh, understand that until I was writing this book. Mm -hmm. And I found that very revelatory. And in fact, I realised that it, it was an error of judgment not to tell the Premier um, because he, of all people, would have been terribly understanding. Mm. He's that sort yeah. of human being. Um, but I didn't, and uh, I'm very sorry for that. But, uh, but I did tell him before I published the book, and we had a good chat about a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what wasn't in the book as well... <laughs> Yes, yeah, so there's a little bit of guessing here and there where, where Mary talks about a particular politician. She doesn't name him, but she drops a few clues. So I'm sure there'll be quite a few people going through the book saying, I wonder who that is. Well, <laughs> most people who've been in politics just pick it up you know, in the bookshop and go straight to the index to see if they're in <laughs> yeah. it. And if they're not, they don't buy it, you see. <laughs>